Hello and welcome to another Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany lecture. This is lecture 38 where we'll answer the question, how can you use fossil leaves to study past climates? Now our story begins with the work of the Russian botanist and climatologist Wilhelm Koplin, who grew up in uh, St. Petersburg and had a summer estate in Crimea. Now each winter he would vacation to the south and as he traveled on the train uh, riding down from the cold northern portions of Russia to the warm southern Crimea, he noticed that the plants he saw outside the window of the train changed. In the late 1860s he went to school in Germany and studied the effect climate had on plants. He was one of the first scientists to study the biogeography of the flora of the world. Now to geologists, he's also known for co-authoring a paper with Alfred Wagner, that uh, famous German who came up with the theory of continental drift. And together they published a, a paper called Climates of the Geological Past. Um, his daughter, in fact, was married to Alfred Wagner. Now he was also friends with Mulan Milankovic prior to the Russian Revolution as well. So he was a big player in terms of understanding the past climate a uh, hundred years ago. Now, Vladimir Kupin came up with a classification uh, system that's still used today to group the world into various botanical climates or regions that would be supportive to various plants. So let me explain how this would work. So this is the, uh, this is the Russian olive tree and if you live anywhere in the American West you've likely seen this plant which is a invasive plant that was brought over from Asia where it grows on the Russian steppes. It's well adapted plant for the harsh hot and dry summers here and the freezing cold temperatures of the Russian st steppes and uh, as well as here in the American West. Hence it's found in the same Coplin uh, classification zone. So here it's uh, shaded in pink, and you notice that there's the same classification over here in North America as there is there in the Russian steppes. So um, you would expect the Russian olive tree to grow in any of these areas uh, on the map that are mapped as pink or in this zone. So this is sugarcane. It's our most important source of sugar. Now sugarcane grows in the Copland zone that's colored uh, light blue here. So all these light blue zones, uh, you can grow sugarcane. So Copland's classification had a very real and important purpose. Plants are adapted to particular climatic zones. So the question that Copland asked was that could fossil plants actually be used in a similar way to infer past climates on the earth at various geological periods of time. Now Copland proposed this idea over a hundred years ago. Today in this lecture we will examine three ways to use fossil plants to interpret ancient climates in the geological past. The first technique is what Koppen first proposed using what is called the coexistence model or the nearest living relative model. In the last 50 years more sophisticated models have been developed. The Climate Leaf Analysis Multivariant Program CLAMP and the more modern leaf margin analysis. So let's take a look at the earliest technique that was developed, the coexistence model first. The coexistence model has three steps. The first is to identify the fossil plants that we find in the fossil record. Second, if the species is living, we can look at the habitat of the living plant. Um, for example, does it live in uh, wet tropical environments or does it live in dry arid environments today? Next, we can assign a similar cli climate to that ancient uh, fossil locality. All right, so let's take a look at, at an example of how this would work. So here we go. We have a fossil from the southern Rocky Mountains of Colorado out of the Middle Eocene Green River Formation about 15 million years ago. Now the fossil is identified as belonging to Acer. This is a genus for uh, maples. And indeed, it looks very similar to modern maple leaves. The modern southern maple tree, Acer floridum, lives in the more wet and warm southeastern part of the United States today. And none are known uh, living today in the Rocky Mountains. So looking at its modern distribution, we could assume that the climate 50 million years ago in Colorado 
would be similar to that in Georgia and Mississippi today. But we need to be very careful here. Is our fossil really a member of this species? Now, this is the black maple tree, Acer nigrum. It also looks a lot like our fossil leaf. And it grows in the much cooler climate, similar to Illinois and southern Michigan. So was the climate in Colorado more cold or more warm? Indeed, this is one of the big problems with using the coexistence model. Depending on how confident our identifications are, it can have a really powerful effect on the resulting climate range that we reconstruct from the past. So if our fossil belongs to Acer nigrum, we would interpret a temperate climate with cold, snowy winters and hot, wet summers. So mean annual winter temperatures are around 22 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 6 uh, Celsius, so below freezing, to you know 37 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 3 degrees Celsius, with mean summer temperatures in the 70s uh, Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius to you know uh, the high 70s and and high uh, 20s uh, Celsius. So, if the fossil belongs to Acer floridum, we would interpret a humid subtropical sort of never getting much below freezing, so low temperatures in the winter ranging from about 30 to 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, so negative 1 to 4 degrees Celsius. Summer mean temperatures around 70 uh, Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius. So that's, that's a pretty big difference between these two, just depending on how we identify this, this particular fossil. Now another problem comes up if there is no living species for the fossil. Maybe this fossil is actually, in fact, a new uh, different species of, of maple that's not living to, to de today. So we'd have to sort of try to interpret what that might be. Another problem comes up if there's no living species of the fossil. Maybe the species is a new and uh, different species of that's different than the living maples. Um, then we'd be kind of at for a loss, right? We won't be able, we could only then speculate at what the climate might have been like. So here are some of the problems of using this method. Uh, first, you must be able to identify the, the fossil really confidently. Um, second, you must be able to define what that nearest living species might be. And third, you must assume that the species habitat preferences related to climate has not changed over that long period of time. Now, since its proposal over a hundred years ago, not many paleontologists actually use this model anymore. Modern paleontologists rather have been looking at something called physiognomy. Now physiognomy uses morphological features that reflect some functional or physiological feature of the plant. For example, many plants live in desert environments will have thick, waxy, succulent leaves to help the plant conserve water. Now, finding a fossil plant with these features would indicate a dry desert environment. These features are convergent, they're homoplastic across many lineages. Although homoplasia has been our enemy in the past, here it is very helpful. Plants don't have to be related to each other. So leaf physiognomy is particularly useful for deducing temperature and precipitation patterns because the leaf is instrumental in maintaining uh, plants' water and temperature balances. Today we can see this in practice when we visit similar climates on different continents. Often the plants will superficially look similar because they are adapted to that particular climate. Uh, such as these unrelated plants which exhibit similar adaptations for living in a dry environment. Rather than looking at the identification of the fossils, we can just look at the morphology of the plants themselves. One of the first paleontologists to use this in figuring out past climates using fossil leaves was the American paleontologist Jack Wolf. Now, Wolf traveled the world collecting modern leaves and entering them into a database of their forms and shapes. He constructed a complex way of codifying these shapes into a multivariant database with many categories for leaves. In 1993, he published a monograph explaining how to conduct what he called CLAMP, which stood for Climate Leaf Analysis Multivariate Program. So here's how it would work. A paleontologist would assemble a collection of fossil leaves from a locality. 
These leaves, each one, would be codified into a database based on the occurrence of various key shapes and sizes of the leaves. Using this large database of modern leaf shapes, the program would spit out an estimate of the ancient environment based on these shapes and appearances. For example, it would spit out humid, subtropical, winter low temperatures ranging from 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, negative 1 to 4 degrees Celsius, summer mean temperatures around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius, mean annual precipitation at 10 uh, centimeters a year. Now what's so amazing about this was that we actually got mean annual temperatures and precipitation estimates for the geological past. It was pretty amazing, but it required a lot of work in coding all of those leaves. And that also was something that was a bit subjective based on who was doing that coding. Now later paleontologists realized that the complex database contained a few traits that really had the most effect on the, the temperature and the precipitation. Peter Welf noticed that simply looking at how toothy the leaves were actually gave a good estimate of temperature. More toothy margins are found in colder climates, as well as the overall size of the leaves. Larger leaves are found in wet environments that can support bigger leaves. So looking at the jagged edges of the leaves and the size of the leaves could get you a great approximation of the past climate. This is actually much easier to do, and it helped to prevent subjective categories. So what's the difference down here of, of uh, Y and Z, you know, that it was in the clamp model? So there are two camps of paleontologists that fought over which method was best, and many paleontologists have adapted the more simpler leaf margin analysis today. So why do we care about this as geologists? Well, one is that stable isotopes for temperature and precipitation in terrestrial environments are, are actually controlled by many factors other than temperature and precipitation. So that fossil leaves are actually a key way to get at these proxies for climate in terrestrial settings and for the study of climate change over the geological past. And the second important thing to this analysis is it can be used for studies in tectonics where we're interested in determining paleo altitudes in the past. For example, how high were the Wasatch Mountains here in Utah during the Eocene? We can use the estimates of temperature and precipitation to help reconstruct the landscape that has vanished long ago. So fossil plants are really important tools for figuring out the past climate and for figuring out the ancient landscape and topography. Thanks for watching another lecture video. If you're interested in taking a geology course at USU, log into our website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my own research and who I am, take a look at my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thanks for watching.